this is CB Up for Discussion, a podcast series from Community Business, where we tackle DE&I and wellbeing hot topics with special guests from across Asia. Hello, I'm Scott Jones, Senior Manager for the LGBT Plus Program at Community Business, and I'll be your podcast host for this episode. Today, we're delighted to be up for discussion with Jerome Yao, co-founder of Hong Kong Marriage Equality and also the CEO of AIDS Concern Hong Kong. Jerome started his career in Canada as a journalist before gaining experience in corporate communications, content management, media, public relations, and external affairs. Turning his attention to the NGO and not-for-profit space, Jerome has used his expertise in strategy and communications to advocate for change in Hong Kong. He's been instrumental in the LGBT plus fight for equality, bringing positive change through advocacy, community engagement, and public events. Today, Jerome is widely known for being co-founder of Hong Kong Marriage Equality, dedicated to eliminating discrimination against same-sex couples and promoting the development of laws relating to LGBT plus equality in Hong Kong, as well as his work as a board member and now CEO of AIDS Concern Hong Kong, which is dedicated to ending AIDS in Hong Kong by 2030. He's a valued and respected member of the DEI community in Hong Kong with a wealth of knowledge that we're looking forward to learning more today. Jerome, thanks for joining us for Up for Discussion. Well, thanks for having me today, so. So Jerome, tell me, how did you and Gigi Chow become co-founders of Hong Kong Marriage Equality? Did you know each other before? No, I think lots of Hong Kong, lots of people in Hong Kong obviously have heard of Gigi's name, but I did not know her until actually it all began um, in Bangkok, Thailand, back in uh, late 2018. Mm -hmm. So I was there for a regional conference on marriage equality in Asia. You know, by that time, obviously, uh, looking back, uh, we all knew Taiwan would become the first place in Asia that would uh, uh, recognize uh, same-sex marriages. Uh, So anyway, in the conference, um, uh, there were three three people from Hong Kong, myself included, and I met Gigi there. And, you know, uh, the conference was a very good one. And at the end of the conference, uh, we were talking about what should be done in Hong Kong, uh, realizing that the momentum was there, I reveal. If uh, so, bring back, bring the turn the clock back to uh, late 2018. At the time, the most important case in front of a court of final appeal uh, was the uh, case concerning an immigration officer mm. uh, f- fighting for uh, for uh, his rights um, in the realm of um, uh, income tax and uh, spousal benefits as a civil servant. So to, to, to cut to the chase, basically, we, we knew, the, you know, at that time the momentum was there. And when we returned to Hong Kong, so we regrouped in early 2019, and we sort of decided that uh, I think the time was there, you know, to, to, to uh, set up a an organization dedicated to uh, advancing marriage equality in Hong Kong. Awesome. Um, have you seen an increase in support for Hong Kong marriage equality now that the uh, top court in Hong Kong has um, made a decision regarding creating a legal framework for recognizing same-sex partnerships? Oh. Absolutely. I mean, the most obvious, you know, if we believe in numbers, I mean, last year uh, there was this survey saying 60% of the population supported same-sex marriage. Uh, that's obviously an all-time high figure in Hong Kong, reflecting on the level of support. I remember, you know, I've been so paying attention to this uh, survey, uh, the number kept increasing. So, mm-hmm. yes, uh, no question about it. Excellent. Um, Our key campaign this year at Community Business is on social mobility. Um, In your capacity as CEO of AIDS Concern, can you comment on the role that stigma and fear play in reducing social mobility for affected people in Hong Kong? Yes. I think, to put it very simply, when it comes to social mobility, I think what what we talk about here is an individual's dignity. When it comes to stigma and discrimination, obviously that, you know, two things go against uh, dignity, because in the end, what we are talking about is, is an individual's sense of self worth. Uh, it's not rock. It's basically, it's no. It's really no rocket science. You know, quite simply, you know, you have, if one has to live with stigma, discrimination, and prejudice, I mean, obviously, that would impact that person's sense of self worth, and in return, that would lead to all kinds of problems. Mm-hmm. So that obviously would impact the person's social mobility. Thank you. 
Um, at Community Business, we definitely know the, the power that the corporate sector can play in helping to drive social change. Um, can you elaborate on how partnerships like this have supported your work, either through Hong Kong marriage equality, uh, AIDS concern, or any of your other advocacy work? Well, just, just you know, again, going back to how much time, or how many hours uh, uh, so a working person has to spend, you know, basically what I'm trying to say here is we have 24 hours a day. Mm. One third of the time, you know, it's spent in, in, in a workplace. Mm. So obviously, um, corporates could play a role in elevating employees' um, uh, welfare and well-being. And, and in, in, I mean, in this regard of, of uh, whether it's LGBT or some of the wider issues, I mean, what I would say it's uh, it's really encouraging that over the years I have seen more attention has been paid to, to this area you know under the under DEI or you know obviously ESG much more broadly speaking um, um, I mean to make it more effective one thing I always keep saying is you know it's always good to have a policy because everything starts from a policy mm. especially in a workplace or in a corporate setting but that's not good enough because Policy is just a piece of paper. We need to make it work, and how to make it work it depends on, uh, or, you know, how what sort of plan or plans uh, a company might have. Um, just a few examples, for example, you know whether they, they could they would come up with a task like a working group or a task force of sort, and, and they try to drive, you know, drive these messages across the whole organization. And when the time is given to those who are involved in driving, you know, these policies, obviously, you know, uh, we per perfectly understand, you know, people may have different roles, they have job work to do, but I think it's important to give them time. Mm. And, and more importantly, it's whether we see uh, uh, real actions by the leadership, you know, it's important for the, for, for the leadership to show their events promoting DEI and really give encouragement because I mean that sort of leadership it's important mm -hmm. to tell employees that you know as a company we care it's not just a slogan or a piece of policy and then last but not least obviously is whether there will be changes in when it comes to HR policies like be it leave or, or fringe benefits and those sort of things those are real mm -hmm. um, you know and, and obviously most importantly it's uh, to create uh, um, a safe environment where people can feel that, uh, you know, having a policy is not r sort of really forcing people to come out, but really to encourage mm -hmm. employees to be uh, true of themselves. Because what we are talking about is you want to have happy employees, and in return, the companies obviously will, will benefit from productive and happy employees. And mm -hmm. I think it's it's a win-win thing. I agree. And, and that's, you know, something that we definitely track through our inclusion index. and. Mm -hmm. um, We've definitely seen progress over the years mm -hmm. in, in all of those things, the policies, yeah. the leadership. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree with you. It's really important to have top-down mm -hmm. messaging mm -hmm. um, for it to kind of get to the, mm -hmm. to the culture of the company. Yeah. So building on this theme, what advice would you give companies looking to actively support their LGBT plus uh, rights and public health initiatives? Um, I think there are two or three things. First of all, always start with a policy. Start with uh, policies. You know, policies set the tone. So you start with policies and you look at whether the policies are truly supportive of DEI in general. It's, it's particularly LGBT uh, employees. Um, the, the most second tangible thing is to, uh, I would say, come up with a program that works for that particular company. And I'm not saying. You just cause a copy and paste from uh, another program because I think mean, different companies they have different cultures and different employees, and I think you just need to find the right uh, way or right framework. And the best way to do it is to actively engage employees. Uh, it's not either a top-down or bottom-up approach. As I would say, it's an ongoing process. It's a journey. It's an ongoing dialogue and conversation. Mm -hmm. You try to find the right elements that work. You know, there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. And you try to also take it into account sort of cultural background. I mean, obviously Hong Kong. If we're talking about uh, multinationals, obviously many quite often what I've seen is uh, you have all these HR policies already in place, but at the same time uh, they may not fit the local context, and they need to be adapted and try to really sort of engage uh, local employees because in terms of local employees may 
may not have a sort of full understanding of the value of DEI. They mm. sometimes, I've heard stories basically saying employees, they just don't feel engaged because they thought, oh, it is just another piece of policy or maybe or why should I support it? And I think a lot of explanation needs to be done. Mm. And thirdly, when it comes to the, the most practical point, it's look at the fringe benefits. Uh, say, for example, mental well-being. Nowadays in Hong Kong, everyone is talking about the importance of uh, uh, mental health and uh, how to support uh, employees and mental well-being. I think it's a big thing for companies to, to really to, to take a look. Um, you know, whether a company, you know, whether within the existing fringe benefits policy or package that includes any uh, elements that will support mental health, if not, perhaps one thing to think about is companies can always work with an NGO that, that provides um, uh, mental health services and, and see what kind of a, 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 a sort of collaboration that can be uh, that can be done because I'm sure sometimes we just need to think outside of the box in the sense of you know it's always good to have a policy uh, and then certain things could could work within the policy but if what about the policy is not good enough or whether there isn't such a policy and understanding you know for any company um, you know uh, making sure that it works within you know within the budget it's important but I think there are ways, you know, in Hong Kong, there actually many NGOs mm. uh, provide um, mental health uh, services. And I think it doesn't hurt, you know, companies can, I mean, if a company, let's say, collaborates with a well-established NGO or, with, or an NGO with a good track record of providing such services, mm. then, you know, on one hand, you help uh, the NGO, because of the NGO all depends on, you know, referrals and whatnot, you know, to, 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 to sustain the, the, the operations. Mm. But on the other hand, employees could have uh, access to, you know, to, to, to some sort of mental health services. It's not quite often you need to go to, a, as let's say, a psychiatrist or psychologist, because I think with, within, you know, the spectrum of mental health services, there are all these different people providing all kinds of different kinds of services. Mm. And it's important, I think, again, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's a cliche, but it's true. Prevention is always better than cure. You want to intervene early on, mm -hmm. and sometimes it may be it may be simply employee may just require some counseling. You know, you don't want to wait until the problem becomes getting much bigger. Then, 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 then I don't think that's a very good sort of direction to go into. Mm. That's a good point, and I think um, if I can say, you know, um, I think that's been one benefit maybe of, of COVID is yeah. that. You know, it did open up a lot of dialogues about mental health, mm -hmm. um, and it put much more of a focus on it in, mm -hmm. in Hong Kong and yeah. probably everywhere. Um, but I think that's you know, it is critical to 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 find what speaks to people, like what's going to motivate people. Mm -hmm. Is it is it is it the business case? Mm -hmm. And you know, mental health is a huge part of the business case. Mm -hmm. You know, like if, um, absenteeism mm -hmm. and turnover and yeah, mm -hmm. disengagement. So I think I think that's really true. We've been running our LGBT plus program for um, since 2020, mm -hmm. and we've been really delighted to see um, the program received with enthusiasm. And we're building a robust pipeline mm -hmm. of um, LGBT plus talent that we're hoping will be the next generation of inclusive leaders. Mm -hmm. um, and we're building a, a nice big um, alumni mm -hmm. group that we, we mm -hmm. see around a lot. Um, what do you see ahead if for in terms of LGBT plus youth in Hong Kong and across across the Asia region? Um, that's a very interesting question. I think that the future looks uh, looks good in the sense of I think um, across the region, what we've been seeing is uh, an increased level of awareness about LGBT issues. Now, uh, the caveat being is you know Asia is a very big thing, a, a big it's a big region, mm -hmm. and um, and it's it's important to bear in mind that when we talk about Asia or or, or, or what are we talking about? Which area are we referring to? And, and some places are doing better than the other. So that's something we have always to keep, you know, in mind about this. But that being said, I think it's encouraging that you know, obviously, thanks to technology, it's easy to get uh, information these days. And and certainly in certain places in Asia, what we're seeing is a slightly more enlightened approach. There are many challenges. I don't want to dismiss those challenges. So I think you know. Um, um, 
it's sort of heading in the right direction, generally speaking, mm-hmm. save for some specific challenges pertaining to specific uh, places. Um, I mean, coming back to Hong Kong, I, I would say, um, uh, overall, I would say it's heading in the right direction. Um, if you look at the level of uh, awareness and support, I think it, it's, it's all showing some good signs. I always tell people, you know, you, you're always good to refer to those numbers because th- th- those numbers give you some concrete idea as to w- where the support is. But another thing that can never be reflected by number is your personal observation. Why I'm saying that is, you know, especially in Hong Kong, a place where there isn't a culture where you have, uh, I always say, two guys so holding hands. You know, this is not in some places where holding hands. It's a very kind of social thing, you know. Here in, in this city, holding hands usually uh, mean it usually means that those two persons are in a sort of more intimate sort of relationship. So um, you have two see girls holding hands, really no big deal. But you have two guys holding hands that naturally would, <laughs> would you know, would, would spark interest among mm. passerbys. Um, in Hong Kong, all I've been seeing over the years is uh, is. It's not uncommon these days to see guards holding hands on streets, and it's not limited to a particular area. It's pretty much everywhere. And I initially I thought it's because where I tend to go to these places where there could be a bigger chance that I'm seeing some guys holding hands. And so I started asking people. I said, "Hey, what do you think?" Mm-hmm. And people kept telling me, "Oh, that's true. I've seen these here and there." And not kind of all over Hong Kong, mm-hmm. and one thing I, with my conclusion, is that means that the younger generation, in general, they feel more assertive and comfortable about their sexuality. Mm-hmm. Uh, they feel safe to to show their affection out in the public. So that's a good sign. Excellent. Um, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you for coming. No, thanks for having me. Pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to CB Up for Discussion. For more information about our work across Asia, head to the Community Business website.